Good morning and welcome to Islington Baptist Church morning service. We are so happy that you are with us today. It is a new day and a new month and we are thankful to God for his many blessings. As believers, it is important for us to give thanks to God each and every day. I know that during this pandemic period, it is so easy for us to be consumed by all that is happening around us that we lose sight of the many blessings that God has given to us. It is our nature that when things are going bad that we sometimes forget to say thank you. But Philippians 4 verse 6 reminds us that we should do everything in prayer and thanksgiving. So I challenge you today to have a heart that is filled with thanksgiving and praise unto God. Let us pray together. Lord, thank you for your undying love. Forgive us, dear Lord, for being ungrateful for the many blessings that you have given to us. We pray, dear Lord, that as we go each day, that we will lift praises and thanksgiving unto your name. Help us to have a spirit in us that is filled with thanks and praise each day. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure
So there's a few things going on that um, uh, we need to pray about together as a church, as always. And when the Lord brings someone to your mind, uh, probably best, best practice is, is don't say, well, I'll wait till I have a prayer time later in the day. If someone comes across your mind, just take a, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, take time at that moment to pray, to pray for the person. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to dig into 1 Kings chapter 10 together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can be together as the people of God, as ones called by you and uh, called out of this world to be your followers, forgiven of our sins, having uh, heaven as our home and possessing eternal life. We thank you for your gifts so uh, rich and abundant towards us. And we think of your call in our lives to live holy lives, to be righteous, to love uh, you with all our hearts and soul and mind, to love those around us, to love our neighbor as ourself. And uh, we pray that for the filling of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we would be people of patience and perseverance, of compassion, of kindness, of grace, of justice, people who are hardworking and not uh, merely concerned about our own affairs, but concerned about the care of other people. And so we pray you would put that in our hearts. We pray for strength. We also pray that you would find us as ones who uh, are passionate about your word, that we might know how to live before you. We thank you for the gift of your word. And we pray for discerning hearts and, and hearts that would be uh, yielded to how you would tell us to live, not living according to the standards of this world or according to popular opinion, but ones who are committed deeply to you. We pray for our sister churches where, that are meeting today. We pray for safety for them and for us as we meet. We pray uh, as we think about, we thank you for the good strides taken here in Canada and Ontario as it regards uh, keeping this disease uh, uh, at bay, but, but, but our concerns, Lord, are with Brazil and with India and with uh, America, and we think of uh, how widespread uh, this, uh, this disease is at this moment. We pray for people that would be obedient to their leaders. Uh, we pray that uh, for uh, the strength and help of those that are working in the hospitals and for those that are suffering, we pray for relief and comfort and healing for them. We also, Lord, we pray for um, Marion uh, uh, Gibbons, uh, who's continued to grieve the death of her son, for Leo and Reka and others uh, in mourning. We pray for your strength for them at this time as they go through the valley of the shadow of death. We think of Paul and Antonio as they have uh, some heart tests that they're looking into, and we pray for strength for them and for their families. We pray for Matthew as he's studying for his exam, that you would bless him and strengthen him and help him to remember when it comes to the day of his exam. We pray for our families, Lord, and it's, uh, it's hard, and it always has been, to be a mom or a dad uh, and uh, to raise a family. We pray for strength for our mothers and fathers. Uh, we pray for unity in the family. We pray that when there's been disruptions, that there would be reconciliation. And we look to you for strength because we can't do this on our own. And so we pray for the filling and work of Christ. We also pray now, Lord, that you would help us as we look into your word, give us insight into it. And I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would grip each of our hearts and that we might have a uh, deeper appreciation of your person, of your wonder, of your glory, and of the gifts that belong to us in Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn with me into the book of 1 Kings, uh, chapter 10. And in this particular passage, uh, which we're going to look at in a minute, we're going to be introduced to a lady um, known as the Queen of Sheba. And she makes a long trip to go and see King Solomon. Prior to her um, going to see King Solomon, there was, which we looked at last week, the transition from David as king to Solomon being king. And as with everything in David's life, it wasn't an easy transition. Uh, we, when we looked at the life of David, the calling of David, every step of the way was uphill and there was always obstacles to overcome, and sometimes it feels like that in our own life as well. And yet David pressed on, and by the grace of God, the, the, the baton of leadership was passed from David to Solomon. David, as we looked last week, gave some very specific instructions to Solomon. He says, there's some loose ends that you need to take care of if you want to be firmly established as king. And Solomon obeyed his father, and uh, the, his, the kingdom was firmly established following that. Um, and in the midst of that, Solomon uh, purposed to follow God. He offered a, num a thousand burnt offerings to the Lord. 
uh, at one occasion, and it says, the Lord appeared to him in a dream, and God said, ask for me, from me, whatever you want, which is an amazing offer. And we can, we fantasize and say, if I, if I had a blank check, what would I ask God for? Uh, and yet Solomon was, he showed wisdom that he already had because he said, you Lord, I, I'm not interested in live a long life. I'm not interested in great riches. I'm not interested in the death of my enemies. What I want is I want wisdom to govern your people. And God said, that's a good prayer request. That's a good request of me. And God blessed him with supernatural wisdom. And Solomon became known the world over as the go-to guy. If you had a question about anything, didn't matter the subject, um, he could instruct you and teach you and you would leave satisfied because the Holy Spirit was moving and working through him, which is an amazing thing. You know, sometimes we see these uh, pilgrimages that people take and you'll see this... Uh, this person's perched on the top of a mountain and you make a long, arduous journey uh, to go and ask the wise man on the top of the mountain for an answer. Um, and you might get some crazy answer. Uh, and yet, that in real life was Solomon, not on a mountain, but in the city of Jerusalem, reigning on the throne that God had blessed him with. Um, the nations and peoples of the world streamed to Jerusalem to see Solomon to hear the answers to the deepest questions on their hearts. That's how incredible the gift was that God gave to him. And the neat thing is, is God says to us in James chapter 1, verse 5, if you lack wisdom, ask God for wisdom, and he will give it to you. Solomon, one of the first acts of his as king was he built the temple of the Lord, and, th and then there was a great ceremony of dedication. Uh, there was a, an, a high, uh, basically a, he functioned in a certain way as a priest at the point because he, he gave this great intercessory prayer uh, for the people of Israel, um, for the people, whether they be scattered by war or famine or hardship, wherever they were in the world, he, he says, God, would you listen to the prayers of your people if they would humble themselves, if they would repent of their sin, and if they, if, when they face and pray towards this temple of yours in Jerusalem, would you hear their prayers and give them, come to their aid and give them relief? That explains, some of you may wonder, why do Muslims, for example, why do they pray towards Mecca? Well, they, they basically took that idea from the Old Testament scriptures and, and Solomon's instructions regarding when you pray, pray towards Jerusalem. That's why when Daniel was in Babylon, every day, what did he do? His practice was the same. Three times a day, he would go up to his, up, his window in his room and he would pray facing towards Jerusalem because he was following the pattern uh, given to him in, in, in the dedication of the temple by Solomon. Now, the neat thing is, today, you and I don't have to face towards Jerusalem when we pray. There is no temple on earth anymore. It was destroyed because, as God said to Solomon, he was a, God is always straight up with people. God said to Solomon, he said, if you follow me with all your heart, and if you attend to my commands, I will bless you, and I will preserve you and your name and, and your descendants on the throne. But as if you or the people abandon me, this temple I will destroy and I will scatter you uh, and you'll face judgment because of your sin and if you rebel against me and turn to other gods. That's how straight up God is with us. He says, and he straight out says to Solomon, he says, uh, don't be overly impressed by this building that you've made for me. What's more important is your heart dedicated to me and your obedience to me and your faithfulness to me. It's always the main thing in our life. Um, is, is the heart and our dedication and commitment to purity and holiness. And yet Solomon builds it. He gives for a pattern of prayer. Um, the city and the city is, it's the golden age in Israel's history. And, by, and when we talk about a go usually a golden age, we think of this sort of a, everything is, is well. Every, everyone is at peace. Everyone is happy. That is the reign of Solomon. For one brief moment in Israel's history, it's the shining, glorious moment of their history, the golden age of Israel, and the city was literally packed to the brim with the riches of the nations. Money and gold just kept flowing in um, and, and, and kept coming from all over the world. And so it actually points us, uh, for those of us that have read the entirety of the Bible, we're like the streets, are, uh, not the streets, the city of Israel, uh, Jerusalem is filled with gold, and then you're like, wait a second, I, I remember reading in the book of Revelation when it talks about the new heavenly city of God uh, and the streets being of gold. And so this, this 
age of, of, of Solomon, time of Solomon, actually prefigures, points us forward to the time to come, the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem that the Bible speaks of being uh, made. Just read the book of Revelation as a picture. So that's a little bit of an introduction, backstory. And then we come to chapter 10, and we're told that Solomon receives a very special guest, the Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba was not her name, that's her title. She's, we don't know her name. We also have, a, there's a little bit of a gray area because we know that she traveled um, from the uttermost parts of the earth, um, probably coming from somewhere, either, a, there's two options for where she came from. She either probably came from around where Ethiopia is, some 4,000 kilometers away, or she came down on the other side of Europe, deep in where modern day Yemen is. So if you look at a map today, you'll see Saudi Arabia, and below Saudi Arabia is the country of Yemen. So those are two possibilities as to where she came from. Both are very far. Uh, and, and so she comes um, loaded with a great caravan of spices and gold and precious stones. Why does she come? Because she's heard of the fame and wisdom of Solomon. Uh, now here's some art, so, and, and, and art's always fascinating if you're able to see it. Art always uh, reflects biases of culture and people. And we see that even in, in famous, these are some of the most famous pieces of art as it regards the Queen of Sheba. In fact, movies, some of you, uh, I don't think any of us remember the name Greta Garbo, but Solomon, okay, Bruce, <laughs> back in the, no, uh, 1959, I think the movie came out about King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Um, but movies and plays and musicals and stories abound about the Queen of Sheba. She's an incredibly popular person in modern culture and in writings. Uh, so we see art, we see European art. Weirdly enough, she's white, um, but if she's from Africa, she's not white. Uh, and so the German picture, uh, with, there's a German picture from the 1800s, there's their depiction of her um, as, an, as an African lady, which makes sense, really. Um, if she indeed came from Ethiopia, then she'd be African. Uh, and so, but this is just a depiction of how famous she, she uh, was um, in that day and how, how her fame continues. Now, there are some legendary, and by legendary I mean not true, um, stories about uh, the Queen of Sheba. Ethiopia literally claims her as their queen. Uh, for the last... Oh, two, three thousand years, Ethiopia has said the Queen of Sheba belongs to us. Uh, in fact, in uh, 19, uh, well, actually, there's a little bit of, a, this, is, this is obviously not true, but this is part of Ethiopian culture. So Ethiopian culture, will, it's believed by, the, by, generally speaking, that when the Queen of Sheba went to visit Solomon, that Solomon uh, and, and the Queen of Sheba had a child together, and that child became the founding king of the Ethiopian Empire, the Solomonic reign in Ethiopia. And that's part of Ethiopian culture and history. And in fact, so, so part of Ethiopian culture and history, there's a book, uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, there's a book called the Kebra Nagast, which dates to the 6th to 12th century AD. So it's a long way removed from 1000 BC. So it's, it's, it's spurious at best. But needless to say, this book is purported to tell the account of the child produced between Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. And it began the Solomonic uh, dynasty that was part of the Ethiopian history, which that's, there is an Ethiopian history of dynasties. They all claim Queen of Sheba to be their founding, and that's, they all claim that Solomon is the father. Uh, now that is all spurious at best, but it does give some credence to the thought that maybe Queen of Sheba really was from Ethiopia. We're gonna, dis we're gonna get rid of the whole they had a love child together thing. Um, but uh, now the other thing that's part of that is actually Ethiopian culture also claims that the Ark, which goes missing, they also claim that the Ark resides in the country of Ethiopia. I'm not making this up. This is, this is part of Ethiopian understanding of, of, of of Bible history and culture. Uh, there's, in this book, 
The, there is a king in 1872, his name, well, Prince Kassa wrote Queen Victoria in 1872 because the British, the French, the Portuguese, the Dutch, name another country, they had spent time conquering the world and, you know, whatever they were doing. Um, well, the British at this point had taken the book. They had this book. And, the, and Prince Kassa writes to Queen Victoria in 1872, and he says, my people will not obey me unless I literally have this book, um, which, which basically claims that, that uh, she ben Solomon had a child, and he's, he was a living descendant. He, they actually claim he, he's the living descendant. And he says, my people will not obey me unless I have the book in my hand. So there's quite an interesting backstory to the Queen of Sheba and Jerusalem thing. Now that, we're not going to put any great stock in that because I don't know that. I just know that that's the stories that abound as it regards it. But what we do have is we have a visit of, a, of, a, of this lady, the Queen of Sheba, who travels land and sea to go and visit Solomon to ask him the questions that are on her heart. Now, uh, in terms of that, the Ethiopian connection, in my mind, it's Ethiopian connection works because I, when I look in the New Testament, Acts chapter 8, you have this Ethiopian eunuch. I didn't realize how far it was. Like, it blows my mind. It's 4,000 kilometers. Like, it's not a short trip. This Ethiopian eunuch has come a long, long way to Jerusalem to worship God. Um, that shows you there's something real in his heart. Um, he's reading the book of Isaiah, and, and he doesn't understand what it means. God sends Peter, and Peter just, God arranges one of those, those things that God does where he arranges people to be in the right place at the right time. And, they, and Peter explains, because he's like, I don't understand what I'm reading. And he says, actually, this is about Jesus, the Messiah. And, and then the man commits his life to Jesus Christ and is baptized that very day as a follower of Jesus the Ethiopian eunuch. And you wonder, what's this Ethiopian eunuch connection? Well, it could, it could have reference ultimately, it makes sense to me, to maybe where the Queen of Sheba actually was from, even though it's not listed in 1 Kings chapter 10. But anyways, it's 4,000 kilometers um, by car. Uh, it's faster by air, but she didn't have an airplane in those days. Uh, she might have, some people think maybe she took a boat up the, the Gulf of Aqaba, um, Solomon had a port that he, the king of Tyre, Hiram, it's kind of interesting. It mentions Almagwood in the passage. King of Tyre was in northern Israel. He and Solomon were in business together, running a fleet of ships down the Gulf of Aqaba into the Arabian Sea. And they returned in ships with gold, immense amounts of gold and treasures, it says in our text, which is pretty amazing. That shows you how wide reaching. Uh, the empire that Solomon had and his influence in the world that he, they were able to do these amazing things. And it's all because of God's blessing. It had nothing to do with Solomon. It's everything to do with God drawing the nations to himself. Uh, so she makes this long journey. Um, I've given you some backstory, but let's look at the passage together and then let's unpack it because uh, there's much more for us to discover this morning. When the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. And when it says test Solomon's hard questions, she didn't come because she's like, you know, I'm going to, I hear this guy's all that and I'm going to like go and fool him. No, that's not what it means. She came to test him with hard questions. There were some burning questions that had been in her heart her entire life. And she's like, I hear that there's someone uh, that, can, that can maybe answer those questions, I want to personally go and talk to them. She came to test him with hard questions, the things that were buried inside of her. Uh, arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. Now that's amazing. You know, we, we go to a counselor and we talk about what's on our mind. Solomon is functioning as a counselor. Doesn't matter the subject. Him and her have a conversation that is wide ranging and every single thing she talks to him about. Um, Solomon, and it says this, Solomon answered all of her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. 
When the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace that he'd built, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cupbearers, and the burnt offerings that he made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. So she said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. Everything is true and more. That's amazing. Um, I didn't believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me in wisdom and in wealth. You have far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your people must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Praise be to the Lord your God who has delighted in you and has placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. She then proceeded to give the king 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spices and precious stones. Never again were so many spices brought in as those that the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Then we have this little subscript where it says, Hiram's ships brought gold from Ophir. Some people even speculate. I don't know what to think. Some people think that's ancient Philippines. Like I said, he sent those ships with Hiram down out into the Arabian Sea uh, on, on multi-year ventures to bring back ri the riches of the world back to Jerusalem. So who knows? But in the Philippines, they actually claim that they're the Ophir that's spoken of. Um, uh, Hiram ships brought gold from Ophir, and from there they brought great cargoes of almug wood and precious stones. The king used the almug wood to make supports for the temple of the Lord and for the royal palace, and to make harps and lyres for the musicians. So much almug wood has never been imported or seen since that day. And then verse 13, King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba all that she desired and asked for, besides what he'd given her out of his royal bounty, then she left and returned with her retinue to her own country. And so that's um, an amazing visit. Now we need to unpack it. And the thing that's part of unpacking it, on the next slide, um, here's the main point. Right at the top, there's two things. So we've got the details of the text. We understand some of the backstory that swirls, some of the legendary material that swirls around it. Then we see the actual facts of the text. But then when we try to un start to unpack the text, we say, okay, well, what is the point? How do I apply this? How do I understand this where I am? Uh, and when we step back, and this is not just my idea, this idea, I was, I was contemplating the text has popped in my head, and I'm like, oh, I, I want to research this. And lo and behold, this has been a standard interpretation of this passage and of this text. And the standard interpretation is this. Solomon is a type for Christ. And, we, and I'll unpack that in a moment. But the Queen of Sheba is, is a, but also is a type. She's a real, literal person, but they're both, and he is a real, literal person, but they're types. They point us forward, they point us to Christ and our experience of coming to him. She, Solomon's a type for Christ, but she is a type for, the, for one who earnestly seeks after God. That's, that's her part in terms of, if you look at this passage, how does it point me forward? How does this connect me to Christ? into faith. And now, in terms of her, be, her uh, being a real person, um, you know, Jesus affirms Adam and Eve in the scriptures as real, literal people. He <coughs> affirms the flood. He affirms the account of, of Jonah. He affirms uh, uh, the Queen of Sheba as a real person, because he says in Matthew chapter 12, the, uh, the thing in Matthew 12 is the Pharisees and teachers of the law, they're there before Christ, who is the auth who's the word become flesh, the savior of the world, but they're skeptics and unbelievers. They're trying to trick Jesus. When, when she goes to Solomon, she's not trying to trick Solomon. She goes earnestly. But when the Pharisees are with Jesus, who is the one who's the fulfillment of the Solomon, Solomon's pointing forward, they're not there to be in awe of him. They're there to try to trap Jesus. And Jesus says to them, as just after they've demanded a sign, he said, do you know what? the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and they'll condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Um, and indeed, one greater than Jonah is here. The queen of, Sa of the south is going to rise up in the day of judgment. You know, she's going to stand up and she's going to say, I journeyed over land and sea to seek the wisdom of Solomon. And when I heard of his wisdom, the wisdom of God, 
I, I held myself in awe of him and I listened. Jesus says, she's going to stand up and condemn you because here you have the one who holds eternal life itself in his hands and you're not coming to me. In fact, you're rejecting me. She will stand up and condemn this generation because the one of whom all of scripture points is here now. And yet this is, this is how you respond when you hear the, the very words of God. Uh, and she will condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And now one greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is saying, I'm greater than Jonah. I'm greater than Solomon. He also says, in, it also says in the scripture, he's greater than Moses. He's greater than the angels. Look in the book of Hebrews. Christ is greater than all. He is the one supreme. And yet there is, there is the struggle of people to accept him and put their faith in him. And so Jesus affirms her as a uh, real person, but he also affirms that typology. Solomon is a type for Christ. S Queen of Sheba really is a type for the one who earnestly seeks after God. Uh, in terms of, of that, let me unpack that for a moment. I have it on the next slide. Um, when we think about Solomon as a type for Christ, we, th we consider the wisdom, the insight, the understanding that he has on every single subject. It's amazing. Um, no person on earth exists who has that breadth of knowledge today. There's some people that are specialists in physics. They're specialists in, in a certain kind of medicine. They're specialists in terms of building. They're specialists in terms of computers. And yeah, maybe they've got a little bit of knowledge on this and a little bit of knowledge on that. But there's no one person you can go to and say, today I want to talk to you about this. And then tomorrow you're like, hey, new subject. <laughs> I want to talk to you about that. Solomon was that guy. There was nothing he could not expound on or teach you about or understand. It's mind-blowing when you think about it. Um, and what is the, it's a divine, supernatural gift that God gave him insight into everything. There was no subject that he couldn't plumb. But he's a type for Christ. Because Jesus knows everything there is to know about everything and anything. In fact, when people spoke to Jesus, they spoke about Jesus knowing the very thoughts of their heart. And so he's a type that points us to Jesus and his knowledge. There's the splendor and glory of Solomon's throne. Gold, 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 gold. Um, now, when Jesus came, he came as a servant with his glory veiled. And yet, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, he says, I want to show you something. I'm going to show you uh, myself and my, my heavenly glory, the glory that I had, that I left my father's throne to come down here to save you. I'm adding a few things, but that's the whole point of it. And Jesus reveals himself in his glory. Uh, and Solomon in his glory is a type, a shadow, pointing us to the true glory of Christ. Who we're, and, and, the, and the end of it is, is that, that, oh, that when we read the scriptures and we walk, and you know, we're supposed to develop our walk with Christ. We do it by the pursuit of him in worship and prayer and the study and meditation on the scriptures, that our eyes would be open to who it is that we're serving and that we'd have a fresh and greater appreciation every day of the person of Jesus Christ and of who he is, the treasure that we have in him. And so consider, and then we consider the, as a type, the reach and extent of his influence worldwide. The nations are streaming to the city of Jerusalem. Um, it is a magnet for everybody. Uh, and then we speak about the scriptures about how um, the nation's drawn to Christ. It's pointing us to Jesus. Um, the happiness, the prosperity, the well-being of Solomon's subjects. And then we think about our estate in Christ and the state that, the state that we are to be in as ones content and blessed of the Lord. Our problem is, is we get so distracted by the physical that we forget the spiritual, which is far more valuable and the inheritance that belongs to us, and the, and the Holy Spirit who indwells within us. We, we sometimes get um, lost in the moment when we forget the, the eternal things that belong to us. The justice he dispensed, first hardest case, two prostitutes, and they're like, whose baby is this? Um, and, and we see the wisdom that God gave Solomon, that he was able to dispense justice. And then we see the perfect justice of Christ, who knows every heart, who we actually, the Bible says, is the judge of the world, and that all will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, and Jesus will, dispenses perfect justice, and there's that call, be reconciled to God while you can. And then the role that Solomon took as intercessor, that, that 
priestly prayer of his on behalf of the nation, and then we think of Christ as the great intercessor. Uh, and so all of the, his, the entire thing of Solomon's life points us to Jesus and, his, and it finds fulfillment in Christ. And then uh, the obvious end is Jesus is greater, greater in every way to Solomon. He says that one greater than Solomon is here. He says it's, and, and the queen of Sheba, he says to the Pharisees, is going to rise up and condemn you on the day of judgment because now one is greater than him is here. And that one that's greater is Christ. And so then we think about uh, the Queen of Sheba, and let's unpack that. We've got five quick points to go through as we think about uh, her being a type um, and representative of every earnest seeker of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first amazing thing is, when we think about her journey towards the Lord, she'd heard of the Lord, she'd heard of the wisdom of Solomon, she says, I want to find out for myself whether it's true. And, and that inquiry on the, on the part of a person, one day it was in our hearts to seek after the Lord, but that, that sense of inquiry and desire to, to know, that's something that's, that we want people to have. I've heard about Jesus Christ. I've heard I need to go and find for myself. Some people, it's a half-hearted uh, exercise. They, they're not really serious. They're really happy just living their lives, living for the moment, and eternal things are not don't seem to be that important. They bury it, they suppress it, all the noise of everyday life, they just drown out the internal calling of the heart and the call of God, and they, they, they just stew in the present. And yet there are some who are really earnest and who, are, who don't ignore the calling that's happening and the, and the, and the questions of the heart, and they're like, I, I want to find out. I'm going to search for myself. I'm going to search after God. And here she hears, and she earnestly seeks, and the earnestness is in the very journey itself. Like I said, I had no idea that it's 4,000 kilometers. But now once you put it on a map and you realize, you gotta be real serious to do a 4,000 kilometer trip 3,000 years ago, <laughs> right? Today, you could hop on an airplane and do those 4,000, that's a eight hour, eight hour trip, probably, right? Not then, that's months. Of, of journeying through hard wilderness, hard lands, with a whole bunch of people. Why? Because you have heard about someone who can answer every question you have. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to go personally myself. She didn't, and she went with a prepared heart. She went with a heart that said, you know what? I am willing to listen to this guy as I ask my questions. She didn't go, as, as for her earnestness, she didn't go like many people go today. Some people that you bump into, they fire off questions left and right. They're like, well, why did God do this? And why does God do that? And if God's so good, blah, blah, blah. And they just left and right fire all their hard questions, right? But do they really want an answer? Not really. They're only firing the questions at you because they want to throw you off your game. Um, uh, and, but, if they, but every once in a while you bump into someone who's genuine, who actually will listen to a, a, a reasoned answer, and who is thoughtful, and who is actually asking uh, the questions of their heart with a desire to know. This is her. She is an earnest seeker of God who the, the, doesn't mind traveling over land and sea, 4,000 kilometers on a, I can imagine the, the the, the sores on your backside, let's imagine you were on a camel being bounced for 4,000 kilometers, <laughs> right? Well, just some calluses, my friend. <laughs> um, or I would hope maybe they took a ship up the Gulf of Aqaba. That, that, uh, that'd make the journey a little bit easier. Just hopefully she didn't have uh, seasickness. Either way, it's a long journey, but there's earnestness. She wants to see and have an appointment with Solomon. There's also the fact that she comes personally. You know, if you were the king, queen of a country, and you're like, I heard about this legendary guy, I want to find out if it's all true, you're like, let's send Bob and Larry, right? <laughs> and have them come back with the answers. That's easy, right? That's the easy way out. But, but when we think about coming to Christ, we don't come, when, I, when you came to Christ, when I came to Christ, I don't come with the questions that my mom had. I don't come with uh, the questions my father had or my grandfather had. I come with my own questions. I have to make the journey myself. And I have to be earnest about it. The journey to Christ is pictured in what 
she does. She, she's earnest and, she's, and it's personal. It's not, it's not about someone else's questions, it's about her questions, which feeds us into the third point is, you know, she, as, as for matters of the heart, um, it's her questions that she's asking. And the neat thing is, is she leaves satisfied and content. You know, that's the struggle you and I have. We come to Christ and we, you know, we, when, the, when we come to Christ, there's that moment where the Lord works, the Holy Spirit works, and we're like, I am a sinner. I need Christ as my Savior. I, I know, understand there's a judgment day, but this is the escape to God's judgment. And there's the blessings that come to know Christ. But then sometimes, you know, there's still questions we have unanswered. And that's okay, because that's part of growing, growing up in our faith, working through life and wrestling with things. But there is ultimately to be a matter of surrender on our parts when we hear from the one who is the Word made flesh. And he says in the Word, this is the perspective you are to have. There needs to be some degree of surrender on our parts to say, God, you are right. Help me to understand. Help me to accept Help me to come to a, a point of satisfaction and contentment in you. And so there needs to be a willingness of the heart, just as she had this willingness of the heart, is whatever the questions were, and we're not told what her questions were, but she had them answered to her satisfaction, so much so that she leaves overwhelmed, and it's more than she could ever imagine. And that's, that's the beauty of coming to Christ, is when a person comes to Jesus, and you hear about Jesus, you hear about forgiveness, you hear about your heaven as your home, and then... God, and, and at that moment when we, all of a sudden, you know when everything is clicking? Now, the, our problem as Christians is, is we forget those moments. Uh, and, and, and yet there's, there's, re, there's times of refreshment and renewing where they, everything clicks again by God's grace in our lives, and we're like, oh, now I, can, I see it again. That's the journey that we're on and our pursuing of Christ. But how amazing that she comes to this she comes to this where everything makes sense. Solomon has answered her every question and her heart is at ease because she's met with this counselor king who can answer everything. When you and I come to Christ, who are we coming to? We're coming to the one who's greater than Solomon. Counselor, king, comforter, knowing all things, holding all things in his hands, our lives and our future, in his hands. And so the sense of if she could be satisfied, then God worked that in my heart too, that I would be, that would be my spirit before you as, as a child, before their, their parent, uh, resting upon their provision. And this is an amazing experience of a, she's a picture of an earnest seeker after God and finding it uh, and finding those answers. And then the last thing, two more things is, it, it bears to note again, the Queen of Sheba is, a, is also a type of, and reminder of God's great plan of salvation. She's a Gentile. The Bible says salvation is first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Um, we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Um, and, 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 yet, and so she, but, it's, but all the way back in Genesis, what's God's plan? God's plan is that people would be reconciled to him no matter where they are from, or what tribe they're from, or what people they're from, what color their skin is, what gender they are, male or female, young or old, the people would be reconciled to him um, and brought to him. And she is, a, she is re representative of that because she's a non-Jew journeying over land and sea to come into relationship with God. That's God's amazing plan of salvation being for all people. And then the last thing is, and this is really uh, important, you know, her trip was expensive. Expensive trip, right? Um, Athel, I know it costs a lot to go to India, right? <laughs> um, other folks have traveled. Yeah, we've done trips where you're like, okay, I've saved up my money. Bruce has done the same thing. We've, we've got our $10,000. We're ready to go to the Philippines for three weeks, right? Um, six weeks. Okay, my bad. You, get, you, stretch, you stretch your dollar, my friend. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, trips are expensive. This cost her a fortune. Right? She, she comes with 120 talents of gold. That's 270 million U.S. dollars of gold. She comes with spices in the amount that no one's ever seen that amount of spices before, and precious stones plus whatever her royal entourage is. Does she, and then the thing that's important to note is she doesn't come to buy Solomon. 
It's a gift. It's a sacrifice. Um, Solomon wasn't, there wasn't a guy at the, at the desk that's like, well, wait a second, you, you're here to see the king? Show me your wallet. <laughs> right? No, it, they brought their gifts. The, the treasury of God was filled up by the nations of the world. It's part of that picture of the nations coming and the, and the, and the, and, and the sacrifice brought. But it was an expensive trip. Um, I don't know what she had left in the bank after she left, but she brought a ton of stuff. And yet, what's the point? She leaves far richer than when she came. Um, and physically so, but spiritually so all the more. Um, it says in the last, it says that King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba, verse 13, all she desired and asked for, besides what he'd given out of his royal bounty. So it, it, uh, was she expecting that when she came? I don't know. Um, but, King Sol- she, but she left with more than she came she came with, but that's not the most important thing. It's not the fact that she left with physical stuff that's important. It's the spiritual that's the important. And the picture of her is really a picture of us. In coming to Christ, we come with these misconceived notions of I'm bringing God something. We're coming empty handed. What, what can you and I bring that would ever result in us being reconciled to God or somehow buying or earning his favor? No, we come as we are, and we come as sinners, we confess our sin, we put our faith in Christ, and we leave far richer than we ever were ever before. And and there's a beautiful verse, what is it, Ephesians, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of what? His grace. And and, and then uh, in 1 Peter 3, we're going to see this verse in a minute as we celebrate communion, is the inheritance that is ours. And so when we come to Christ, the picture of her coming, making sacrifice, uh, giving, and leaving richer is a picture, ultimately, of the journey of an earnest person seeking the heart and in, uh, in face of God and of Jesus Christ, and c- going away satisfied, going away with a sense of, wow, consider the, and we consider the glory of Christ, and oh, that our eyes would be open to perceive the glory of Christ. But there's the eternal understanding, I am far richer than I ever was before. Because you and I can't take anything out of this world, but there's an inheritance that awaits for us. The Bible talks about storing up for ourselves riches in heaven and glory. That's the amazing thing about the coming to Christ is that, that one, the forgiveness of sins, but the eternal inheritance that belongs to us. And so it's an amazing picture. There's lots of legendary wild stuff, the Ethiopia connection, the, the, the perhaps connection to the Philippines and the Ophir and all this stuff. But at its core, Solomon is a picture for us, a type for Christ. Queen of Sheba, real person in history who really did go and visit the, the king, but she's a type for the, a person who's an earnest seeker after God. And when you and I come to Christ, there's no other person to go to for the answer to our questions, for the forgiveness of sins, for eternal life. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table together. Uh, For those of you at home, if you have, uh, that are Christians, that are followers of Christ, uh, if you have uh, your juice, uh, your cracker, these are a reminder to everyone that these are symbols of the body and blood of Christ. We partake in obedience to the command of Christ. Do so in remembrance of him. Uh, Wendy and Rob, I'm going to ask if you would help with uh, distributing. Uh, what you're going to do is uh, come and uh, you'll take the plate. There's a tong. And for those of you that are participating, if you would drop it into the outstretched hands of uh, whoever's uh, waiting. Um, and so please, this is, as Wendy and Rob come, uh, go back up. Let's read that verse. I'm going to read that verse. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. It's an amazing verse. And, and, you know, she came, she left far richer. You and I, when we come to Christ, there's an inheritance kept in heaven for us that can never perish, spoil or fade.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that, uh, for uh, the, the blessing of your word, the lessons for it. We pray that you would find us, find us um, giving you the glory and honor that you are worthy of. We think of your greatness, Lord. We pray that you would open up our eyes to apprehend how beautiful and majestic you are, that we might never forget that which we are possessors of in Jesus Christ, the inheritance kept in heaven for us. And we pray that you would find us faithful in holding on to our faith and in living for you today. We thank you for your sacrifice on the cross for us, the shedding of your blood for the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I am not skilled to understand Well, for those of you that have the little cup, there's two layers. And uh, the first layer, we'll, we'll, we'll partake of the entire uh, bread and cup at the same time. So I, let's figure out how to peel it back first. So there's a thin film on the top that, when you pull back, that, that uh, reveals the, the cracker. And then the uh, silver, um, the silver one is for the juice underneath. So we can peel that back at the same time. It's a little tricky, but there we go. And just as a reminder, we come in obedience to Christ. We come and partake together as the body of Christ. You know, the joy is, is that we are not living the Christian life on our own. We've been brought together under the kingship of Jesus. Uh, we're mindful that we are to walk together as brothers and sisters in the Lord, forgiving each other, bearing with one another, loving one another. Uh, and uh, asking God for strength that we could love those around us and, and be faithful in our witness. And it all has to do with Jesus and his death on the cross and his sacrifice for us. And, and in Christ, we have the forgiveness of sins. We have the hope of heaven, the hope of the resurrection. All this is bound up in our Savior and our Lord. So then, um, it says, it, For I receive from the Lord what also I passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, I'm so thrilled that we can uh, spend this time together this morning looking into God's Word, um, keeping our eyes fixed upon Jesus. I would encourage you as you go this week, every day, there's, uh, you and I have to do the same things. We remind ourselves we're the followers of Christ, uh, and we also say, okay, Lord, as your follower, help me to live for you, help me to live a holy life. And every day, which would help us, we say, thank you, God. Try and, we try and say, thank you, God, for at least one thing every day. Uh, to live as a people of gratitude. The Lord bless you. I hope you have a great week. Um, we're gonna, there's some hand sanitizer for the offering. If you came prepared to give your offering, the plate is here. And we, uh, we're required that we exit the building a different way than we come in. So put your masks on and we can make our way out this way.